are here to talk about COVID-19 as ever. And the, the lockdown, because of that uh, outbreak, much as it has helped to contain the spread uh, of the scourge, to, to some extent, economic experts say it also has impacted negatively on some businesses as well as the country's economy. Well, this morning, a management consultant, risk analyst and former director of the NDIC, Dr. Pascal Ebohime, joins us now to take a look at ways to salvage the current problems and help the masses against the new economic realities, even as more Nigerians return to work. Well, good morning, Dr. Pascal. Let's talk about the negative aspects. As people do prepare to return to work tomorrow, what type of Nigeria are they expected to see next week? Um, <clears throat> first, thank you for having me in your program. Um, I think before we look at uh, uh, those expectations, as they resume to work tomorrow, it is important that we all understand the nature of the war we are fighting. Uh, briefly, I would like to illustrate this by saying that the war is between coronavirus, which is invisible, and those Nigerians that are infected and they have been identified and they have been isolated and put in the isolation centers. Now, the enemies we have are the viruses and the Nigerians who have not been tested. If you like, you can refer to these two enemies, virus and those they have infested, as vampires. And the rest of us in our homes and those outside, they are potentially dangerous because on, on, until we test them and prove them otherwise, they are potentially our enemies. Now, what do I mean? The only people that are fighting this war are people who have been tested and killed, and there are very few Nigerians. Now, the two main instruments for fighting this war are total lockdown, 100% enforced, and secondly, those that have been tested and they are found to be infested and put in isolation center. Now, these are the two major strategies. But you see, the government had good initiative of coming out with the lockdown directive all over the country. But by focusing on the three states, Lagos, Ogun, and the Federal Capital Territory. And of course, in recent times, Kano. These are the epicenters. That was a very good move. But unfortunately, Nigeria did not cooperate with them. Because the strategy is to lock down. And don't forget that those that have been locked down are not essentially free of the virus. But they are separated from one household to another. So within a household, you could have one person that's infested, infected, and then they could affect the other members of the family. So it was an opportunity for government and the rest of us to cooperate with the government during that period of total lockdown to do comprehensive testing. First, among those that were outside, the frontline workers and the head workers, to be sure that none of them carry the virus. They become the soldiers. And then the, they will not take on, on the household one by one by mobilizing all the resources at their disposal, mobile test kits, and then come everywhere and be sure that the number of people that have been tested, they will identify those that are infested and take them to isolation center. By so doing, they would have been able to contain sufficiently those are referred to as enemies. But unfortunately, uh, the restrictions have been removed. And here we are. You now release those that have been quarantined under the lockdown arrangement. They are, they are going to join the society 
are the, are the problem become more complex. So you don't yes. think it's a good idea? Mm. You so, don't think it's a good idea for us to uh, lift this lockdown, even in fa phases? Are you saying that the risks far outweigh the rewards in this instance? Yes, that is what I'm going to talk about now. Now, when these people are now released, the only protective devices they have now is the use of face masks, which is like an army officer wearing a, uh, a protective uh, uh, armor, armor, you know, to protect, you know, uh, any armor attack or whatever. So, but the issue now is this. All the companies that were directly affected at the lockdown initially, like the uh, aviation and uh, tourism industry, we're trying to look at the industry now. Then you look at the uh, uh, hospitality industry, you look at uh, uh, manufacturing, you look at trade, you look at, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 even banks. Only a few banks opened. Many of them were, were closed down, were shut down. Now, if you look at those that were directly affected, including real estate and construction, what has happened? There was immediate revenue loss. Immediate revenue loss. So the implication of that is that when you now release their, their staff who are not, have not even been tested, the implications for those that have been tested will be more. So the environment, therefore, particularly the people environment, have become highly uncertain. Yeah. Then secondly, the overall environment of business today have become very volatile, highly uncertain, highly unstable and ambiguous. Now, under this kind of environment, no business can do well. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, Dr. Pascal Ebohime is a management uh, consultant, risk analyst, and former director of NDIC. Uh, we'll put you on hold. When we return from this break, we will come back and discuss more. Thanks for staying with us. We've been speaking with management consultant, risk analyst, and former director of the NDIC, Dr. Pascal Ebohime, who before the break uh, was talking about the health uh, implications of lifting uh, the lockdown, talking about Nigeria's lack of preparedness, in his own words, uh, for this uh, post uh, lockdown era, which we're about to enter into uh, from tomorrow. But let's switch gears uh, to the, the economic impact of all that we have been experiencing as far as COVID-19 is concerned. And even more importantly, uh, post-COVID, how prepared? Do you think Nigeria is really prepared uh, for a post-COVID uh, um, economy? Yes. Uh, let me quickly also add that when you remove the lockdown restrictions, what you have invariably done is that you have increased the strength of the enemies. You now have more viruses to fight. Now, the implication of this for businesses is this. Apart from direct revenue loss as soon as the lockdown took place, having to ask the staff, particularly the factory staff, those who are on the what are handicraft, handicraft technology aspect of the business to stay at home, meant that a lot of production cuts, a lot of um, uh, supply chain challenges. And what is most striking is that we have failed to realize that Nigeria is a system made up of subsystems. Where the subsystems are the states. Within each state, like the Lagos, I will use as an example to illustrate the, more, the difficulty we are going to experience post-lockdown, is that within the Lagos, the various geographical areas are subsystem within Lagos as a system or as a subsystem. But what that means is that there are a lot of interdependencies. So for the businesses, therefore, even when we lock down or shut down many of the, of the businesses, even those that we said they could be operating, like the service providers, you know, the pharmaceutical, the telecommunication, uh, electronic media and the rest of them. They cannot do without those other companies that have been shut down in terms of supply chain interconnectivity. So the problem is as complex that we can imagine. 
So what we are going to have is a situation where many of these companies were not even prepared. Only a few were proactive. But developing what I call a continuity, a business continuity plan. But many of them did not carry out any risk analysis of what is going to come. For instance, they did not even look at the implication for staff. That many of them did not even have the digital knowledge. And come to look at it, in the actual management of business, the top management staff who take decisions, they can do so through online. Video conferencing, Zoom, cloud you know, meetings, and the rest of them. But the factory workers, the front workers, they need to be fiscally there to move impulse, input through a process to the finish uh, product for outward uh, transmission for consumption. But you see, when you lock these people out, it means that all of a sudden, the business stops. And now you're asking them to resume. The first challenge they are going to have is that do they have a turnaround plan to start the business all over again? Because it's a new game altogether. They will require a new set of mindset, new set of competencies, a new set of behaviors to be able to cope with the new mandates. Now, don't forget that before the close down, they would have produced a number of things for export, those who export, or to sell. All of a sudden, they didn't have this opportunity to do that. Now, some of those products may have been wasted. Some may have, you know, been overtaken by events. And so the major issue they are going to have this one week, it's not even to, it's not overnight to just start work and start producing. The staff, for instance, employee will be consigned about the safety work environment. Some have challenges at home, some are sick. The children are home, they are not at school. They will be thinking of the children. And many of them will be thinking about, you know, uh, that they have not been paid salary. How will they meet uh, this and meet that? So the level of motivation of the staff would have gone down. Then come to look at the competence, or rather the capability and capacity of the staff. It could, it could, it would have been possible that if they had the time before the lockdown, many would have been sent for one form of training or the other to acquire just a time type of training to be able to cope with certain uh, job, job demand. But unfortunately, they couldn't do this. Now they are coming back. They cannot be talking about performing that job. The first thing is the safety of the people, the okay. safety of the management. If I may jump in with all you have said and bearing in mind some of the uh, moves uh, mitigating uh, measures that the CBN, uh, indeed the federal government, has put in place to help uh, businesses uh, not to you know, go into full recession because that is what uh, we're looking at. Uh, things like credit lines, tax uh, rebates, loan uh, renegotiations and all of that. Are you saying that this uh, may not be enough? If not, is what more would you expect from the CBN and indeed from the federal government uh, to help businesses? And especially considering the fact that many businesses actually in the uh, informal or non-formal sector, which make up about 80% of the uh, economy. This is a very good question. The issue is not about how much loans that the central bank has uh, offered or has advanced, like 50 billion Naira, or from the federal government, or from any other source to support this institution. It's not much about the, the amount of money that is available for business. Because the dynamics have changed, the, these businesses have to go back and re-strategize. Meaning that they cannot just start to spend that money, even if they have to take the loan. For instance, they may have to review their product offerings, prioritize, and see those that are still relevant. Because don't forget that they will be taught each product they are manufacturing, they will be thinking about the expected buyer or the customer out there. But some of them have limitations because they have been shut down in other states because the products once produced, they have to be sold. So they have to look at a number of issues. Now, for the informal sector, which is the largest sector in terms of 
you know, the type of foods that will, uh, uh, food and support services that Nigeria will need, you, can, you will all agree with me that that area is badly affected. But it is important for us to bear in mind that without the informal sector, those in farming, those in the uh, uh, security, and so on and so forth, just name it. Now, the performance of this informal sector is very, very important. But unfortunately, they are not well developed. I think that is an area that the government must look into going forward because they have to look in what? You know, there are many of these agricultural items that can be exported. exported. What Nigeria needs to be richer is to get more foreign exchange rather depending on, the, on what I call the single track monolithic oil, which is not sustainable. Already we are aware that the oil market has, the demand has fallen and the price has fallen. You can imagine the, where the, 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 the Asian rate, or rather the, 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 the in preparing the budget of the federal government is $57 uh, uh, per barrel. And now we, we, we are even talking about something less than 30 or thereabout. And ordinarily you would expect that the budget will have to be pruned down of the federal government. We of course become a deficit budget. But because they already have projects, infrastructural projects they have to pursue for development within the you know, economic uh, development and recovery growth uh, plan, they still have to continue with it. That is why they have to have a recourse to borrowing, which of course will further aggra aggravate the problem of the government because of the high uh, debt you right. know, servicing right. ratio of about well, on 60%. That topic, on the topic of a high amount of debt, we know that this week uh, the Nigerian Senate expedited the, the president's request for 850 million? Bill billion. Billion, yeah. rather, uh, Naira, uh, to fight the economic ramifications of the COVID-19 pandemic here in Nigeria. What are your thoughts on that? Because we know that th those funds should be, well, are expected to come from domestic uh, capital markets. Yeah. How do you think that that will now put our position in terms of our, our problem with, uh, with debt and how we, how we have to refinance and service those debts by taking on more debt? What, what do you think uh, is the best way out of that mess? You see, the, the problem we have in this country is not much of how much you are able to get from the various sources. Call it uh, IMF, World Bank, you know, even in support of the fight against COVID-19 uh, 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 <laughs> pandemic. It's not much of that. The issue is for this country to reposition itself, right? Mm. It's to reposition itself. Go ahead, so we can hear you. It's to reposition itself, you know, in a manner that they have to look inward and rechannel the resources that we are getting by way of loan to those areas of national development that will make greater return socially. Because it is important we bear that in mind. Because if you get money and you don't use it properly to meet the needs of the country, we will be worse off. Because we must be concerned about servicing now. The only thing Nigeria can do now is to ask, you know, boring nation to forgive the debt or completely forgive the debt because we cannot continue to service that loan okay. because there is an addition to it. So the only way out is to be more productive as a people, look inward, mobilize our people in diaspora, mobilize our people in diaspora in terms of capacity to come back okay. home and develop the private sector. Because unless we're able to develop, you know, the non oil sector of the economy, principally in the agricultural sector, you know, talking about all those exportable items. All right, uh, Dr. Ebohime, let's yes. uh, quickly put you on hold as we try to, uh, you know, uh, you know, this is a very, very important Absolutely. time. I mean, this point that uh, Dr. Ebohime, uh, you know, has been making. And I recall uh, during the Great Depression, mm. uh, Franklin Roosevelt was president in the United States then, and he came up with the New Deal. Uh, which actually helped uh, the private sector, uh, you know, to... Is it way yeah, back is his way back, exactly, you know, to survive, you know, and overcome the risk aversion, which was a major right. uh, issue, you know, at the time. And they were able to finance uh, new opportunities, 
And so right after the depression, but since back, that's, you know, well, since if we, if we compare what's going on now to the 1930s and 1920s to 30s and even to uh, the 20, 2008 financial crisis, we know that this problem that we're currently going through has been definitely described as being far worse than those other instances. So I wonder what type of capability a, a government of today has in order to ease uh, businesses and definitely help people back to life as normal. With the United Kingdom, we know that millions upon millions of people every week are fighting for unemployment. So again, and how just we... Just like in the US, too, exactly. over 30 million people have already filed. Oh, that's what I meant. So did I say the UK? I meant, yes. I meant the United States. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I meant. Yeah. So you can, you can imagine the, the impact that's having on the nation's coffers, how they're able to sustain those types of dependence in terms of their welfare, because uh, the United States, even though we know that a welfare state in, exists in that country, it definitely hasn't been uh, used and utilized to this point. So it'll be interesting to see when we're on the other end of this pandemic, just how countries like the United well, States, I'm, like I'm the United Kingdom, by the House of Reps to do that. that have actually passed the emergency economic stimulus bill, uh, which among other things is to protect the Nigerian worker from losing their jobs, right. you know, until uh, the end of uh, the year. Absolutely. Okay, well, we'll take a short break, and when we return, of course, the show continues in earnest. Do stay with us. Right, welcome back. Thanks for staying with us on the morning show. Before we went on that short breather, we're speaking with uh, uh, management consultant, risk analyst, and former director of the NDIC, Dr. Pascal Ebohime. Uh, thanks so much for staying with us. Now we cannot talk about uh, reviving businesses or even the economy in general without talking about uh, the banks, who themselves have been affected one way or another by uh, you know, the COVID-19 lockdown and what have you. But then again, some banks have been posting uh, profits in the first quarter of uh, this year, which uh, in itself says, well, the banks are not doing too badly. They're still uh, healthy. What role should they be playing now? Uh, I recall some time back, the CBN governor, uh, Godwin Mefele, actually uh, called on the banks to use the funds that are lying fallow in their coffers to help businesses, small businesses? Um, I think the Nigerian banks, before now, many of them have been doing very well. Like any other business, under this kind of situation we find ourselves, highly unprecedented and unexpected. You know, talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, most of the banks were not really prepared. You see a lot of incentives given by the government, by the central, uh, by the central bank, uh, in terms of uh, uh, forbearance and um, reducing the interest rate, and so on and so forth. But the fact that the cash reserve requirement, which have been increased before this uh, pandemic, uh, you know, made it difficult for banks to have enough liquidity to run their business. I think they, they need to look at that. They need to revise it. Now, I also want to mention that the banks, in terms of the quality of their loan assets, is going to be drastically affected. Because most of these companies and businesses that are dependent on banks for loans and for finances, they're not going to do well in the next one year. And so they are going to have a lot of, you know, repayment uh, challenges. I mean, people refusing to pay these loans. You don't blame them because the, their business has not been doing well. But how would the bank be able to survive without paying these loans? So these banks that have been able to declare huge profits, a few of them, maybe they have done much of that before these, uh, these uh, classics, but how sustainable? When you bear in mind that the future of business is highly uncertain. Now, don't forget that banks play an intermediary role. Take money from the, deposit, uh, the surplus units and take it to the deficit unit to support businesses in terms of loan advances. Now, the, 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 the supply of these funds in terms of deposits are going to go down because those who invest in the capital market have lost 
their investment because of, of course, the effect of this uh, crisis. And so people are lo they have lost their weight. And so the, the propensity to save down, we go down. So the banks are going to experience loss of deposits because as they resume tomorrow, they're going to be, people are going to have a rush in the banks to withdraw their money because they are not sure of the banking uh, environment because I said it's un highly uncertain. So the tendency is that some people want to take their savings, running in millions, to save, to save heavens, either by way of uh, buying federal government bonds, or treasury bills, that's why the fact that the, uh, the interest are very low. But you see, Nigerians we are now in a position to say, look, what do we do? Do I risk? Okay, what, I mean, what are yes. the options before Nigerians? So, if, from, if I do get what you're saying uh, correctly, that the banks may not really be able to step up to the plate in terms of helping uh, Nigerian businesses at, at this time. Well, there's been an emergency economic uh, stimulus bill passed by the House of Reps. They've sent it, of course, to the Senate. And this, uh, among other things, to protect uh, workers in the public and uh, private sector. How far reaching do you think this uh, economic uh, stimulus bill uh, yeah, yeah the, the, given the circumstance we, we are today, that, that is a very wonderful initiative. But come to look at it. Under this kind of environment, which is highly turbulent and uncertain, most Nigerian workers are not even likely to spend on anything that is not essential. And I can tell you that most Nigerians are going to spend mainly for food items and for uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, item in terms of uh, health, uh, uh, maintaining their health. So, by and large, many, many banks are going to experience, like I said earlier on, uh, a downturn in the ability to mobilize their deposit. But what banks, I believe, are going to do, because we had this experience before, is that they become much more creative. You know, creativity is the, is, is the new game, because the banks have to now think about new bank products, with, um, with uh, incentives to attract deposits. But again, we have had that experience in the past. Because to what extent can that go? Because, like I said, individuals will not be balancing you know, the objective of, 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 uh, of, of getting some uh, uh, return on their investment by way of deposits, you know, and at the same time ensuring that the, the, their funds are safe. But I can tell you, a greater number of Nigerians will, be, will go for, uh, for safety. But having said that, the other enterprises that have taken loan from the bank, we have the, we have the problem because right now, because of shutdown in many other states, or in even other countries where they have to export their products, and because of you know, border closures you know, and other supply chain challenges, so you can see the challenges that lie ahead for banks in terms of uh, loan repayments. So okay. they, they need to work very hard. And that is why I'm recommending that they need to further revalidate their business continuity plan by focusing on their, on their people, by focusing on the processes, by focusing on the stakeholders or if you like the partnerships, and also focusing on their level of profit. Because banks as company businesses are set up to make profit. Yeah. But you know, you get to a stage like we are in now, that the bank will now begin to work with the government to balance. Not just the only objective of making profit, but also you know, providing what I call social objectives that will put smiles on the faces of their staff and also those of Nigerians. And that is the only way the, the, the country can hold. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, before we wrap, uh, before we let you go, I, I do know that um, in the U.S. about 80 million undocumented workers are eligible for bailout. Uh, right here in Nigeria, 50% tax rebate is uh, being provided for pay-as-you-earn uh, for registered businesses. Should this extend beyond registered businesses to unregistered ones, which, as we established much earlier, uh, make up a larger percentage of, uh, you know, the, the, the economy, the, the driving uh, machinery of the economy in Nigeria? You see, many of these uh, small, small enterprises, they are not properly structured in terms of uh, 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 staff, staff remuneration 
and then they, they are tight structure. It's not, it's not very well structured. When compared to the more organized, older uh, businesses, you know. So it is easy to look at the issue of uh, income tax, you know, give uh, that kind of uh, succor to staff, they pay less and have a more disp uh, disposable income to meet some of the expenses they are going to incur. But you also look at the other side. The other side of the divide is so that those who cannot get their company organized, but they need to be supported. But how can you support them? You know, one area that you can support them is to improve on the basic, uh, what I call, services that they enjoy, like electricity, you know, like water supply. I'm talking about the informal and the non-formal sector. Yes. So if governments, like during this period now, you can see electricity was relatively very stable. Maybe for the reason that many companies closed down, so they have to That's redirect really? transmission, right? A lot of people don't believe electricity has been really stable in, then, around this period. And, but if, if that was not the case, then what do you then think about the students, the, the school children that are home, who have now been made to go through digital learning? Mm -hmm. If the electricity, is, I mean, electricity supply was not uh, regular or unstable, the internet connectivity and um, even the telephone will not be charged. So obviously there are a lot of issues and problems. So the way to go is actually to improve, you know, uh, particularly for the non-formal informal sector, uh, government need to improve uh, performance. Uh, when I'm in government, I'm talking about uh, the, 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 talking about electricity providers, you know, the, the, the various uh, providers, they need to be able to do something to improve on the efficiency in terms yeah. of supply to help the small businesses. All right. Because uh, those are the major cause of uh, input okay. to the business. Uh, absolutely. Dr. Pascal Ebohime, thank you so much for thank joining us. Uh, for my uh, director at the Nigeria Deposit Insurance Corporation. Thank you so much for joining us on the show.